Welcome to Old Guy Tech, the OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. Hi, welcome to Old Guy Tech TV. This is Rob Charney. I'm here today with Rico Oler. He's a good friend of mine, and he's running for the 5th District Assembly. Yeah, I believe that's correct, isn't it, Rico? That is absolutely correct. Okay, good, good. So, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What is it that makes you want to be a run again? You've already done this for a number of years, and, you know, just, just give us the reason why. What is it that's driving well, you to run again? You know, I, um, I really didn't have any intention of running for the state legislature again. Uh, that was not a part of a plan of any kind, but uh, this is a time in history when the state is in such despair, economically and otherwise, that um, if we don't get some grown-ups back in Sacramento that actually know how this works and are willing to fight to change it, um, we're in serious trouble. I used, to, I used to give a speech called the Crossroads Speech. Mm -hmm. I'm about coming to a crossroads. <clears throat> You can't give that speech anymore. We're not at a crossroads. We're at a dead end. We're back to the wall, back to a precipice, in fact. And if we don't turn around and fight our way out of it, uh, we're going to go over the edge, and there will be no hope for California. We'll, we'll be in the abyss forever. So that's what motivates me. You know, I've got uh, four children. They're all grown now, by the way. Yeah, you haven't seen my kids having a no, 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 yeah, no, They're no, all no, grown. grown. My oldest is 28. My youngest is 18. Wow. wow all grown good. up and gone from home. But uh, I, I'm very concerned about the future my kids will have, and even more so my grandkids. What, yeah, what, yeah. Uh, what hope have they got for a, a good economy? Well, uh, we, we definitely have a big problem going on, and um, in its multiple areas. I mean, I don't think you can pick on any just one particular spot. We've got so many. You know, just an example, I did a little investigating as to the lobbying spending that's going on in Sacramento. And what surprised me is that I found that, that the lobbying spending in this three quarters of this year is 12% higher than it was last year. Hmm. And I think that's very telling. Um, I think it's very telling. We've got an awful lot of people scrambling out there to try It'd be nice to... nice to see who the, um, what the breakdown is of who those actual uh, lobbying firms are and what they're giving <laughs> to. I know the, the largest uh, contributor in California politics for many years, unless it's changed very recently, is the California Teachers Association, right. the SEIU. Right. It's all labor unions. And guess what? Right. They don't give money to Republicans right. or conservatives, for sure. They give money to liberals and to Democrats. So um, I'd, I'd like to see what the numbers are. I'd be, I'd be, be yeah. curious to see. It'd be kind of, well, kind of interesting to learn. Something to look into, because yeah. I, I just kind of glimpsed the surface. As, you know, we decided that we are going to do a little bit of you know, seeing what it is um, that we have going on in California and knowing that you're coming to do one of them that really caught my attention. It's, it's very interesting the relationship that uh, legislators have with lobbies. Sometimes it's improper. It's, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, trying to buy influence. Right. That does happen. Right. But for the most part, um, my uh, I was so unlobbied. <laughs> I, was the, I was considered, I think, the least lobbied member of the legislature because I, um, I have a very clear set of values and ideals that I believe in. And as a consequence, people can figure out what, how I'm going to vote on a bill right. without talking to me about it. And they know they're not going to persuade me to do otherwise right. if it's a clearly defined bill. There are cases, however, where there might be a particular representative of an industry, for example, that has knowledge of the ramifications of a bill that you might not have, that you're not privy to. And it's very worthwhile to be able to have their their input and right. to, come, to come to conclusions. <laughs> and uh, But uh, you'll find that... Uh, there's a great deal of influence wielded, and particularly with respect to these things we call turf wars. You know, you'll have a battle between one organization and another, or, or medical doctors and their scope of practice issues. And both sides will pour money into political campaigns, and, and uh, it's, not, it's not wholesome at all. Yeah. Not at all. It's, it can certainly get kind of ugly, I, I, and I understand exactly what you mean. Um, so there's a couple of things that, that I know an awful lot of people are interested in, and one of them is the high-speed rail situation that, that you know that we're talking about sinking a gazillion dollars into yeah. how do you feel about that where, where do you stand well on it's that? just a it's a ridiculous idea to start with anybody that's foolish enough to believe that the state of california is going to efficiently design and build a rail system is well let me back up and say first of all it's social engineering that's what the to begin with Right. The design is social engineering. It's to get people to to have a change of heart about how they want to uh, travel, to take away their freedom. People, uh, our automobiles are expressions of our freedom. Right. We want to have our own car. Right. We, we right. Want, when we want. We're not waiting on a schedule. Um, that's very American, very Californian. And uh, that's the thing is, originally, that was supposed to cost $33 billion. 
the latest estimate, somewhere between 98.5 and $118 billion. I mean, it's triple. Uh, it's more than California's entire state budget. That's right. For this year. Oh, it's... I, it's it's crazy. And uh, I think that... Uh, I think it was a grave error. And, you know, they overestimated to begin with. You know, uh, they overestimated the ridership by about 30 times what, oh, what sure. should be expected. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the, the Jarvis Organization and the Reason Foundation did an outstanding job of critiquing that bill in advance. And uh, But the folks who were making the decisions weren't listening. And some very very uh, uh, uninformed voters uh, voted for it, and uh, we're, the taxpayer will be left on the hook to pay for it. Well, you know, uh, well, absolutely the taxpayers. And it gets back to the lobbying issue that I was talking about, too. I'm, I'm telling you, there's, you know, there's some very strong lobbies out there, and it's amazing what they're able to eke out. And I think high-speed rail was part of it. Oh, that was a union. It was, it was, and, designed, it was designed to benefit labor, uh, big labor in California and uh, at the expense of the taxpayer. You know, get, and, you know, for us in our district, representing the 5th Assembly District, which is you know, from a, a piece of Placer County, Auburn area, all along the, the 49 corridor, all the way to Madera County, what is the benefit for, for people in rural California with a bullet train? We're going to pay the bill. It, bene it benefits uh, Los Angeles. It benefits San Francisco. You know, right. it's the main corridor. Absolutely. And uh, the, reader, the, the ridership is simply not going to be sufficient to support it. And it's a giant screw up. Yeah. Just a giant screw yeah. up. So now, I, where do you. Well, well, they haven't broken ground there. yet. Yeah, no, obviously not. I mean, but, and they've already spent, I don't know how many billions they've already I'm spent sure. planning. And it's, uh, I, I think, what to shut it down right where it stands, say it was a mistake, Yeah. give the money back to whoever has it coming, it, apportion it uh, as, as well as it can be done, and use the money. You know, if, if the money's allocated for transportation, use it for sensible transportation, for goodness sakes. You know, we got potholes, we got lousy roads, we have lots of small projects that could be subcontracted out to private companies right. who would do it well. Let them bid for it. You know, we got some people in this community that do an outstanding, like Doug Verkamp. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What an awesome job he does of, yeah. of things right. like this. Let those people have a piece of this and, and uh, build things that we need and that people want. When the market, when the market wants high-speed rail, by golly, we're going to get high-speed rail because there will be private people that will invest their own money to build it, and they'll make sure it works because everything they have is at stake. Right, right. That's how it works. Well, you know, there's no doubt that the uh, infrastructure needs is in desperate need of repair and mm -hmm. fixing. And, and, and my belief is that there's much better money spent. And besides the fact, it creates more jobs, uh, it keeps people working, and I think that's really important. And I, in our rural area here, I've always felt that you know we're we're second class citizens in many respects. You yeah, know, it's, it's yeah. been that way in many ways. And you know the the predictions for how many jobs were going to be created by the people. I'll listen to this. The HRC actually said that they would create one million new California jobs. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They are out of their minds, and it's just it's deception. And, uh, uh. It's just dishonesty in the worst kind, and it's it's always easier to spend somebody else's money. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you feel that way because I, I certainly am not not anywhere near in favor of high speed rail. It's just it's just well, I'm in favor of it if the private sector builds it. It's their money. Well, oh, cool. okay, sure. I, I might I mean, even try it out if a company wants to come in and yeah. you know, a private party a company yeah. wants to come in and get the right away and do everything. That's fine. That's fine. But I think the the public money, our money, um, I think that's spent in the wrong areas i agree and, and, I agree. and, and it's not just high-speed rail i think we we could probably have a long list of things well you know, you know. the, the tax the tax code is a um a lot of this lobbying problem we're talking about which which you know is a, it's a good and it's not it's not it's a flip side of the same coin there are good aspects uh, badly done and done in a dishonest way then it's a bad thing when it's done honorably toward a good goal it's a good thing there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that inherently it's the tax code however and the regulatory climate that drives those lobbyists, even more so in D.C. than it sure, does here, because sure, yeah. they are picking, the legislators are picking and choosing who the winners and losers are in the economic game of life. Right. And government has no legitimate role in, in making those choices. The free market, government should be nothing but the referee in the game. They should not be a player. They shouldn't be a coach. Um, you know, Solyndra, look at all the things that have happened with government involvement in trying to dictate how people are going to... Uh, how people are going to spend their money. Right. Trying to determine in advance how people will want to spend their money. The market will dictate that. Right. Just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I feel the same way. An awful lot of them don't. I've always felt that if we split California, uh, 
west to east, just kind of up the middle. <laughs> well, hey, you either know? way, it'd be all right. West to east or north <laughs> and south. Uh, that that uh, that was actually tried with a, a, a modicum of success very early on at uh, prior to World War II huh? with the state of right. Jefferson. Right, I and remember that. Yeah, Pearl Harbor happened and yeah. kind of nixed the whole thing. You know, it's funny. That's a good story. The the state of Jefferson really is, is a it? really is a good story. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't know it. You and, sit down with Dan Dellinger and let him yeah. give you the history. I've ridden to Oregon and back with him multiple times. Yeah, that guy is a historian. It. Yeah. And yeah. he could tell you the whole story. It's yeah, I bet he fascinating. could. Oh, I bet he fun. could, yeah. It was fun. Yeah. There was a uh, uh, National Geographic special on it not too long ago. Very interesting. Because you'd drive by and that, that the barn, there's a barn building off to the right <laughs> yeah. that says the state Hilt. of Jefferson. Yeah. Hilt. Yeah. Hilt, it's the state of Jefferson, you know. And yeah. so everybody kind of goes, what? And, well, the, the, somebody just, uh, I don't know, it was yesterday, asked me, so do you think we could ever actually split the state? I've had that question asked so many times. I say, well, when you can persuade the, pe the two-thirds of people in Southern California that are going to be the losers in the deal, to vote for the, the the third to become the winners, yeah. uh, then it'll happen. Yeah. Which means it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's yeah, right. because they, we have the, we have the resources. We're net givers. Northern California is by far a net payer into right. the state revenues. Southern California is a net receiver. Right. So why would they give up the resources that provide that wealth to them when they don't got to work for it? Yeah. Mm, Government yeah. that robs Peter to pay Paul can always depend upon the support of Paul. Well, absolutely, and you know, and the reason I I always said that you look at um, uh, west to east. Uh, you know, on the east side of California, it's mostly red. And you look at the, you know, and you look at something about a, that salt air. I guess it, yeah. Brains. They just, there's something wrong there. I don't, yeah. I just don't understand it. And not, this, I'm talking about a guy who came, grew up and lived in Santa Monica. I mean, I was a, you know, I was a beach kid. You took the cure though and left. I did. I and did. I, came, I took came the, to God's country. <laughs> uh, and I know for a fact there's going to be some out uh, there. Are some of the people who are going to watch this are going to get on me about saying well, that too. But it's, it's all, okay, ladies and gentlemen. It's all in fun. We're just kidding. We love the beach. That's right. I, I used to surf myself. It's wonderful fun. <laughs> so we have a good time with that. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> One of the things I was, uh, I'm also interested in is death penalty. And uh, I, looking up in that, I, I didn't realize, and I don't know where I was, but I didn't realize there was a moratorium on the California death penalty at least till 2013. And um, uh, I, I guess that's when they're supposed to rule about it. So all uh, the people that sit on death penalty right now in, in, in the prison systems, they're all on hold until a minimum of 2013. And costing us a fortune. Every costing day us a fortune. There. So, yeah. what, what's your feeling? Uh, how do you feel about the death penalty in California? Well, I support the death penalty. Uh, um, it it, it, it is, has been used rarely, um, probably should be used rarely, but it should be used quickly, effectively. And once the once the people are convicted, there shouldn't be a 10, 12, 15 year waiting period. The reason it costs so much money to do a death row case is there's so much, so much litigation associated with it. So many appeals, so many ways to circumvent the system and get around it. But, uh, you know, someone uh, in California is convicted of a crime so heinous that they are uh, sentenced to death. They deserve to die. They deserve to die. I mean, they're not, you know, if it's a marginal case or a marginal crime, uh, where reasonable people could differ. I mean, it would be a really unusual circumstance where someone received the death penalty. What they get is life imprisonment or some other uh, some other punishment. Right. right. And uh, we're just uh, we're living in a society that uh, has a real hard time distinguish distinguishing between an act of violence that is in defense of the public or in defense of an individual and an act of violence that is an aggression toward society. Two kids in the schoolyard, you know, get in a fight. When I was a kid, you know, um, my mother taught me that you never get in a fight unless you have to. If you have to, you fight. Defend yourself. Right. But don't ever start it. Right. If I'd ever started a fight and I'd been the aggressor and I went home, I'd have met with a much more severe punishment from my father than I would ever have found in, my, in the school from any principal or anyone else. Right. Uh, today, uh, law does not distinguish between the act of physical violence that is in defense of oneself and that which is an aggression toward another. And they're completely different things. Well, that also extends itself to society at large. We don't distinguish between an act of, of taking a person's life justly because they are they are have proven unworthy of life in this in this world by killing or you know, wreaking havoc on other individuals and and uh, and a criminal act of killing someone. Right. You know, the the you know, the Bible talks about um, you know, being wrong to, to kill. The actual definition is murder. 
you know, thou shalt not murder. It's not thou shalt not kill. Right. So, you know, um, I don't mean to wax the, uh, into a theologian here, but um, it's it's a different it, thing. It's hap- yeah. Well, I, it, now I have, I, I tried to look at some of the studies, and I, I wanted to look at a pure economic situation with the death penalty versus life, life in prison. And I couldn't find anything but conflicting um, probably opinions of s- multiple different people as to what the cost benefit is or not or whatever. But um, I think because people do look at it economically, I think that's an easy out. Um, I believe that uh, if, a, if a person breaks into my home and murders my family, by God, if they get away from me, damn well get the death penalty yeah, I've ima- i imagine if they did that to your in your family there would be very little cost to society except how they dealt with you after the fact exactly <laughs> you, you got that <laughs> yeah, absolutely that's, right that's that's, 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 that's that's how i think most reasonable people uh, would feel but the 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 reason that the cost is so great to put someone to death in california and to have my death row is we don't have the proper attitude toward what uh, to what a prison is about right. prison should be miserable prison should be absolutely miserable it should be a terrible place to be that people don't ever want to go back to again right not a country club i'm not saying that the california state prisons are country clubs but it's, it, it it's got to be, be a penalty it's you know what you don't it, want to send them I to a like, country club i don't i don't i fundamentally do not believe in mature men in particular uh, being uh, treated as criminals that need rehabilitation right. or people are victims rehabilitation means they're victims of society society has somehow not brought them upright they've been mistreated and therefore they very naturally turn to a life of crime. Right. Sort of. It, that's the that's the right. uh, uh, Reader's Digest yeah. version of the yeah. of the argument. Um, I think that the incarceration should be for the purpose of punishment. And maybe that seems harsh, but no, no, no. I, I believe I, it's completely true. I totally agree with you. I mean, the, the whole idea is it is punishment, and and you know, you watch some of these prison programs that are out there, and you watch the interview with the prisoners, and it's almost like it's 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 a badge of honor. For particularly these gang members that we've got, mm-hmm. uh, to spend time in prison, yeah, they they look forward it's to it. Hard, it's like, isn't it hard for you just even to uh, even get your mind around I can't how it. someone could have that perspective on life? I mean, it, it, I, I you try you try to because you have to make judgments and make decisions, especially as a legislator. You have to vote on things, but it's you you want to try to understand what would motivate a person to have that view of the world. Yeah, and I can't get there. I, I can't either. You know, it's just it's, it's just uh, it's beyond just, me. It's just beyond. And me. what a shame. But yeah. what an absolute shame because, you know, yeah. we've got so many young kids that are just being drugged down. Well, you know, I know this is, uh, this could be viewed as an unpopular thing to uh, to say, too. But I think that we have tried so hard to limit judges' authority with respect to punishment, you know, right. because of judges acting badly and letting people, you know, Rose, the Rosebird Court. Oh, yeah. Remember oh, all this? yes. Um, oh, we yes, ratcheted yes. down and passed all kinds of laws to demand what would happen in this case, this case, and this case. And I... Um, um, I think there is, uh, I think there's more room in society for, uh, for compassion at lots of levels. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I, I can speak with some experience of some personal uh, members, not of my direct family, but clo- people that I know quite well. Uh, when their uh, one of their sons was in serious trouble with the law in another state, the judge brought him in and was uh, very harsh to him and said, "Okay, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to come to visit you myself every Sunday." You're going to go with your folks to church every Sunday. I'm going to come visit you every Sunday, and I'm going to talk to you. And I'm going to stay this whole thing for two months. Every Sunday, I'll be at your house, and I'll talk to your parents and to you. And we're going to see where you're going with this thing. And if you haven't decided to have a change of heart, you're going to jail. (laughs) Now, you couldn't do that in California. (laughs) Couldn't do it. It wouldn't happen. For lots of reasons. That's right. (laughs) Lots of reasons you couldn't do that. And And that can be a very effective way to deal with a young person right. the prison system is really really good at taking young criminals and turning them into really good criminals you know it's, it becomes a training ground that and that's yeah and that's, that's sad too. it yeah. really is you know i i it's a what's the sheriff's name down in arizona that, Ar- uh, arpaio yeah i yeah, mean I like him yeah I, I do too he you sure know what, one of the things is that we uh, we we uh we, we discuss problems that are in society and we we go back and forth about why this happens or why it didn't happen and underlying all of that, oftentimes in the back of our minds, is what should government do about it? Oftentimes there's absolutely nothing government can do about it. And government shouldn't even be involved in it. Right. But we, but we have a natural desire to find a solution to a problem. So we identify a problem that we found in society. And we say, here's what we do to fix that one. The problem is that you didn't fix the solution. It just fixes that one. It, it, it affects a lot of other areas of life. 
or it affects circumstances that are not similar at all. Right. And we create another problem. Right. And then we try to fix that one. You know, we just keep moving And then we around. fix that one and fix that, and it goes on and on yep. and on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the other things, you know where my passion is on the Second Amendment. You know where I stand, and I think most of you out there know where I stand, too. Give us your opinion. How do you feel about the Second Amendment and, and, and about, and I can talk about some I'm, things that I'm here. I'm like, uh, like Phil Graham. i got more guns than I need, but not as many as I want. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I really, I, I'm, I, I collect guns and I, I like to shoot and stuff, but, and I love to hunt. I always have been. I yeah. have been hunter all my life, but that's, has nothing to do with the Second exactly. Amendment. Exactly. The yeah, Second Amendment yeah. is about a person's right to defend oneself, one's property, and one's, one's person, one's family. That's what the Second Amendment is about. And we oftentimes hear liberal politicians say, well, I like to hunt, and I don't want to, just, I don't want to take away anybody's shotgun. And, well, that has nothing to do with it. That's not, the, that's not the point. The Second Amendment is an individual right held by individual people. It's a personal right, the same as the right of free speech. All those rights are individual rights held by people. And uh, if you want to go into more philosophical discussion of why that is, um, in my view, and it's and it, my views are completely consistent with the with the founding documents, the Constitution of the United States. Right. We are endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights. They are not granted by government. They're not a matter of convention. They're ours because we're human beings, because God made us, and that that fundamental view informs my views on the Second Amendment, self defense. It informs my views on the on uh, on abortion. I oppose it. Right. It right. informs my views on property rights. All of those things stem from this from this view that we have human dignity. We have a dignity that's granted to us by being uh, the children of God, not by being a ward of the state. Okay, so we kind of want to secure this route, route around, but we'll get back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went a little too far. You went a little bit. I kind of, whoa, wait a minute. No, I, I, no I actually believe that. But, uh, you know, I tell... All, all the people that I run into, and, and it's very simple. Um, without the Second Amendment, there would not be a first. That's absolutely true, okay. and that's a and, very well put. Yeah, and and it's just that simple for me, and and, well I, and I get that message put out there. And so, mm -hmm. you know, just recently, uh, Governor Brown, um, he, he does, he's never seen an anti-gun piece of legislation that he doesn't like. Um, he'll, he seems to sign everything that he that comes down the the road, and he. He, uh, he passed three bills here just recently, he signed, and one is the registrations of shotguns and rifles in California. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to do wonders for the sales of rifles and shotguns in the short in term. In the beginning, it was the same thing you as know, the assault, I, yeah. the so-called yeah, assault absolutely. weapons thing, it went crazy. But, yeah. but, but <laughs> when I read that bill that he signed, and you know they talk about the fiscal impact. The fiscal impact in that bill supposedly was only four. It was four hundred thousand dollars. I did a, what's called Rob's rant. You ever do take a look at it? You, uh, my statement in there was: you can't paint an outhouse in California for for four hundred thousand dollars. Not if it's permitted. <laughs> not if it's permitted. <laughs> well, and not if it has California involved with it at yeah. all. There's no way. And you know, and, and and so besides the whole fact, you know, Brown's out there saying I'm cutting, I'm slashing, I'm doing whatever. And he's passing these bills that. Are going to cost us just incredible amounts of money, yeah. and and just that alone. That's know? just one piece. Of That's it. just the, one piece. The the, the argument that uh, you're going to somehow limit criminals from possessing firearms is is a just it, it just is silly. I it mean, is I mean, a you know, yeah. What you do is you disarm all the people that are honest citizens who don't want to break the law. Right. You know, criminals right. break the law. Yeah, yeah. Do you think they? they they're I gonna, don't think they're going to distinguish between no, that law and no, the other laws. They no. they like to rob people. They steal their stuff. Well, you know, the guns they're, help. Uh, SB four twenty seven is the so called ammunition bill that uh, he vetoed, but he only vetoed because the original uh, version of that bill is in court right now and is being found unconstitutional. And that was the restriction, the restrictions of uh, purchase of ammunition uh, over the internet. Or you know, straight being able to go and buy an ammunition. Other the, that particular bill made it so that um, the original bill made it that there was no internet sales, that you had to buy ammunition in person. You had to sign a ledger, a ledger. You had to leave a thumbprint. Criminals really go out and do all that, don't they? Oh my goodness! You know, you had to have a valid ID. I mean, it's, it it was the ugliest thing. So anyway, that's that's hitting the courts, and he actually vetoed the so-called improved version of that. But I see with Brown down the road here, it's just going to continue uh, year after year. And when you get elected, 
I know you're going to fight hard uh, to get this uh, stopped because well, we, 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 we've got to. We've got to at some point. Yeah. We've got to say, hey, enforce the laws that are on the books now. Don't worry about trying to throw more at us because you can't. They can't do it. Well, that this will probably lead you into one of your other questions. I'm sure you're going to ask something about immigration. But <laughs> Second, next one. You know, I, I mean, a, a lot of the the illegal gun trafficking is across the border. Yeah. You know, we've uh, the war on uh, the war on drugs that we've been waging uh, relatively successfully on two fronts. We've closed the air and we've closed the sea routes pretty well, and we have an open border. People walk across it. That's crazy. We need to build a permanent solid. border who crosses into our country exactly based on our desires and theirs it can be a mutual that's right. arrangement that's right and we need immigrants we desperately Absolutely. need immigrants but they need to come here legally and we need to be able to send someone back to their country of origin who's, who's committed a criminal act and be fairly comfortable they're not coming back to the states again you know if anybody has spent any time in europe uh, it's very interesting to to see that you know you don't cross borders in europe just casually mm -hmm. i mean the the the, the amount of scrutiny that they do from border to border to border is very impressive. And I don't know why here in the United States it seems to be there's a whole faction that says, just let them all come, let them all come. And then, then you hear them talking about, well, we want, to give, we want to give education privileges to illegal aliens, and we want to do this with illegal aliens. And they, that illegal is always the first word. And what part of illegal... Don't you get that? Yeah. yeah. Am well, I, only, I can't, we can't be the no, only I, ones that look at this, no, can we? I mean, no, 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 the last time that I crossed the border in Europe, my mommy was carrying me. Okay. So I, well, I, you know, like I was five. So that I, I don't remember much about that. My son lives in Germany now and, and talks to me about things like that. Um, the the issue of those people that are, um, you know, it's a, it's, we talk about this all the time, and I'm going to speak fairly freely here. I'm not going to be, absolutely. I'm not being too, uh, uh, withdrawn about it we've got a lot of people here that came to work that are not bad people in any way they're good people um you know that if your family's starving you would do whatever you had to do to feed your kids i would now that doesn't mean we should allow it that we should condone it but i don't fault the person that makes that choice i don't want i want them not to be here right, right. illegally <laughs> right so yeah. the, the solution to the problem is build a, a solid border that we can actually close off that prevents people from coming unless we decide they can and then be relatively um relatively free in terms of allowing people to come here to work provided they have a sponsor someone that has a job for them uh they don't have a criminal record you know that's relatively oh, absolutely. simple we absolutely. had a program called the Bracero program yeah. many years ago that was very successful and the california labor unions pretty well shut that down yeah, yeah. no i know you know and and, and and i don't know about your your parents my parents um i'm only second generation uh, when the grandparents came over here, you mean from, it's only been two generations that your folks came from Oklahoma? That's right. How'd you yeah, know? My, same with mine. <laughs> but you know, it was it, it forever amazes me what they went through to get here, yeah. and it meant something. And and it, and it wasn't to uh, take advantage of everything that was here and then send it home. They didn't work with that attitude. And I don't blame the illegals that come here and the farm workers that work hard and they send their money home. I understand things are difficult there, but we've got an awful lot of things difficult here. And when my grandparents came over here, they didn't do it to send money back to Europe. They did it to, you know, improve their family, to improve things, you know, and they did things like learn to speak English. What a novel concept. Can you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, there was no such you, thing as yeah. multi-language ballots, multi-language anything. You came here, you learned to speak yeah, you English. Can't, you can't really, you can't live the American dream if you don't speak English. You can't. I mean, you can't. It's a necessary thing to be able to, to integrate. You know, there are there are groups of people. I, I hate to to, to to name names of ethnic groups for fear someone will get angry at me about it. But um, there, um, Filipinos came to the United States. Lots of them in the twenties, thirties, and forties. Yeah. How wonderfully have they? Lawyers and doctors and business owners and entrepreneurs and and grandparents and just living wonderful lives and they became a they integrated and they were a wonderful addition to our society a great addition and you know we got groups today that have come more recently that people are up in arms about because there are conflicts related to the cultures yep. um, and those groups too will integrate and become great americans but we have to as a society have the right attitude about what it means to be an american right what it means right. to be american not the skin color it doesn't have to do the accents either it has to do with integration into the value system that makes us great freedom 
freedom, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, and being fair and square with your neighbors, paying your bills, right. taking care of a guy in trouble. That's right. what being an American is about. And we've got some wonderful groups that have come here recently that, mark my words, 20 years, 30 years from now, will have fully integrated into our society and, and will be a tremendous addition. Oh, absolutely. It's a great thing. I, I mean, this is but, whole, but, whole but, country. But the ones I'm talking about are groups that, for the most part, we chose. Right. You know, it right. was a, you know right. they didn't immigrate where they, where they came across the border illegally. They came here by sea. And the, the same is true. The Latino people are wonderful. Oh, absolutely. Wonderful absolutely. People. And I'm, I mean, you know, they're hard great. workers, and the majority of them are all honest and everything, but they must come in legally. Well, that they it's must. to their advantage to do that too. I mean, oh, absolutely. you know, you're living underground. If you come here yep. illegally, you're living yep. your life in fear, yep. living underground, under the radar, uh, constantly They're afraid always of worried. trouble. And you know, if you come out of work, a legitimate work visa or yep. a program like the Becerra, Pro Becerra program, yep. you're going to be able to be free. You right. live happily, sh smile, show your face, right. not, not be fearful of any of any hassles. And if you want to send your money home to your family, of course you can do that. Sure. Why Absolutely. not? Yeah. And and if they if they uh, under some of the previous programs, if you did very well and were really uh, you had an employer who was really needed you, you could get a permanent permanent status. Sure. Absolutely. Bring your family. In fact, uh -huh. I'm all for that. Uh, and I am too. I, I think, think awesome. that's a great thing. I think it's you know? perfect. And and unfortunately, what's happening with the illegals that are coming over here? They're being taken advantage of. Oh, no kidding. You know, yeah. uh, so many of them just, just to get across the border, the, border, the coyotes that, that you know, take almost yeah. all their money to get them here. And, you and, know, and, you know what, do you, mean, what do you do if you're if you're here illegally and you're uh, you're out in front of Home Depot and somebody picks you up, take you to work for a day, and they stiff you? What do you do to the law? Yeah, <laughs> not going to happen. No, you're, you're just out of luck. And, that's right. And you know that's got to happen. Oh, it, absolutely. It, absolutely. They, 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 you know, there's so many of the farm workers that are taken advantage of, and but you know, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. You, you know, we need those workers, but we need them to come legally. So I think well, enough said. I think it's a problem our... that's soluble. This is not. Oh, yeah. This is oh, a yeah. completely solvable problem. We just have we've decided we're not going to because it doesn't serve the interests of uh, of, of a large constituency and the uh, large political bloc that has a vested interest yeah. in that kind of activity. Right. Right. Well, and, let's certainly hope that you know when you get in, and then we get some people with like-minded thoughts here that we help these immigrants I, mm -hmm. I i want i all i want to do is help them i don't want to make them be the bad guys mm -hmm. that's, you know? that's the right i think that's the right attitude to have about yeah them. i want them here you right. know we're a compassionate people americans are good people yes and if the government would leave us alone a little bit more we do wonderful things we're we, we're generous but you know the government's taking everything away from us what do we have left to give? Well, I mean, that leads into the, my next question, too, is, you know, wh what do we do with this economy? What do we do to stimulate it? What, you know, what are your views of the help us in, in California to, to, you know, to get back to where we were? Well, there, I, I remember traveling out of the state. I, I used to go playing back east and Midwest and all over, you know, when I was a young, young man. A lot of fun. And I'd run into people that say, oh, you're from California? Oh man, I always wanted to live in California. Guys out there are making fourteen bucks an hour, and out here it's eight. Oh, and it, the weather's so good. Right? I love to live in California. Go to go out there now, and you'll run into nothing but Californians. You go right. to Idaho, right? They're all from right. California, right? Exactly. And they're and they'll say, "Man, I'm sure glad I'm out of that place. I had all I could stand: the regulations, the taxes, the red tape, the hassles, all the rules and regs. They just kill it." So there's there are two pieces to the equation if you want to correct things. One is uh, you got to reduce the regulation on business. You got to reduce the regulation, get it down to a sensible level, and you got to cut spending. Raising taxes is absolutely a disastrously bad idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there there are those who have the view that the economic pie is this big, and it's a question just how you divide it up, and it'll always be that big, no matter how much you take, it'll still be that big. It's nonsense. The pie will shrink. You take too much away from people that are productive, they quit producing. Right. Duh. Yeah. And if you let people keep more of what they earn and give them more freedom to operate, the pie gets bigger. A smaller slice may be more pie. And getting that idea across to to, uh, to the very liberal members of the legislature is an impossibility. Yeah. It's impossible because their view is uh, so entrenched in a philosophy that's a whole lot more like religion than it is like uh, politics that they, empirical evidence is not sufficient to persuade them. They have to be defeated. You have to defeat them. Right. And uh, that's that's what we're going to have to focus on doing. 
So now r remind me, um, District Five that you're running for now is kind of new, right? Isn't that? It's a brand new, new district. district. Yeah, and it's an awesome district. So tell me what From it my perspective. What's encompassed? So I understand a little well, bit. Well, it's um, it's um, Auburn in uh, Placer County, just a small piece of Placer County, including yeah. Auburn and a little bit toward Newcastle, and then in El Dorado County, the line is kind of in through Cameron Park and everything to the east, all the way to uh, South Lake Tahoe and including South Lake Tahoe. Then it's all of Amador, all of Alpine, Mono, Calaveras, Tuolumne, Mariposa, and Madera counties. Wow. It's a it's a huge district. You're gonna wear out some shoes, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna wear out some tires too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I plan. I don't plan on walking at all. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think Go I'll drive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I get calluses. Yeah. No, I. Uh, it's a, it's a very big district, but what a spectacularly beautiful, what an awesome district. Oh yeah. Forty nine yeah. corridor. Yeah. My, uh, you know, I've represented the plaster portion, El Dorado, Amador, Caliber, Alpine, and Mono. I've represented in the past. All right. Um, but I grew up in Tuolumne County, which is a well, there's a large vo voting block in Tuolumne, and I never got to represent that county. And uh, it is so much fun to go there and visit with my. Uh, I told my friend Russell Hamilton, if he's watching this, I hope he'll hear it. He said, "I said, Russell, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to run in this seat, and it uh, it includes Tuolumne County." So half the people in the county are related to me. He <laughs> says, "Yeah, well, you'll probably win anyway." <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, only what a, a friend, great only a friend can stick it. Oh, yeah. Like that. He did it good. Yeah, so. he's a good guy. Well, that'll be great. So that's really, really something uh, for you to do that. I'm really glad to see you come back. So I'll tell you what. We're going to wrap this thing up, but I want you to look into that camera, and I want you to give us your last bits of information, what you really want the voters to know, what's going on, why they should vote for you, and what kind of help they can provide for you. Well, um, let, let me just say that for me, this has always been, my, my political life has always been about the same thing. It's about freedom. It's about people being able to live their own lives as unfettered by government as is possible without harming other people, without causing harm to other uh, property owners or other citizens in their, in their world. If that is the case, if we do that, if we provide that freedom, we'll also be more prosperous. Our economy will improve. Our economy will soar if we provide people that freedom because the economy of California and in fact that of the entire nation is nothing more than the dreams and aspirations of its people. It's, it's what we believe in, what we love, what we want out of life. And if government leaves us free to do that, people are good and we will have a very successful economy. Sounds sounds really good to me. I am totally agreement with you on that. And let me, let me, a uh, couple more things. Okay. My campaign slogan. Right. You like this. Right. Oh, okay. Let's do this too. Rico Aller for assembly. He no. left. <laughs> I like that. And if you do want to if you want to provide support, we're going to need to raise money. That's a necessary part of this whole endeavor. If you want to get your message out, you have to have money to do it. Uh, go to ricoaller.com. It's that simple and you can find the the links to uh, to be able to make a contribution. You can use your credit card or there are other ways to do it too. But thank you so much for taking time. I appreciate it. And uh, Rob, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. This has been it's great. Awesome. I'm looking forward. You know what? what, what we're going to get together again. Okay. It's something I'd like to do every six months because I'd like to kind of know how, how things are going for you as we can work with you and help you on. And uh, off of our site, off of uh, uh, VOGT.TV, stands for the old guy tech. That's me. So <laughs> we'll have links to your website. You and uh, I'm both getting kind of old. Just you know, a little, just I'm a little older than you like, are. <laughs> I know when you were born. I'm a little older, but yeah, that's first okay. First time I met you, I didn't have a gray hair in my head. <laughs> that's but right. I, look what that's no one you've done to me. Yeah. To you, look what it's done to me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> My God, <laughs> Rob, but thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Rico. It's I really, really appreciate it. You. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. And hey, folks, you know what? Find the link to Rico's uh, website off of our website. And hey, I can't thank you enough for joining us. And this is Rob with Old Guy Tech TV. And thank you. We'll see you soon. This episode of Old Guy Tech TV is brought to you by Windfall. Windfall, all the resources for El Dorado County. Everybody needs a windfall. Don't forget to ask about the free classified ads. Windfall is available to assist you in promoting your business through affordable and effective advertising. Call Windfall at 530-621-1698 or send an email to info at shopthewindfall.com. And thank you, Windfall, for supporting Old Guy Tech TV. We'll see you next time.